dedicating this conference to Rich van Koenenberg. Rich actually unfortunately died uh, about three months ago in his sleep. Um, he was invited actually to join us in this panel and obviously um, we're not going to hear directly from him but as things actually happened fortuitously he spoke at a conference um, in uh, the uh, ME uh, Center uh, at the Mount Sinai um, Medical Center last year. And fortuitously, this disc um, is going to be shown today. So we will actually hear some of the benefits of uh, Rich uh, von Koenenberg's uh, work on the methylation cycle, which is um, inherent uh, and maybe actually one of the uh, uh, sites of uh, the problem that we're actually all dealing with. So let me actually now finally thank um, not only the organizing committee but let me thank actually uh, the MECFS Center at uh, Mount Sinai because they actually have underwritten uh, my research assistance trip uh, here, Nicole Schweig, who will actually uh, be saying a few words of what we're doing at ME uh, CFS Center. I want to actually uh, thank Immuniprop Inc. actually for uh, giving some of the part proceeds of some of the products uh, that uh, are being offered. Um, and I want to thank everybody for turning up. It is actually very, very inspiring actually to see such a nice crowd. I'm now actually going to turn um, the microphone over uh, to um, Dr. Weir, who will actually give the first presentation. Um, uh, Dr. Enlander, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I think it was uh, someone like Mark Twain who said that uh, if you want to know what's going to happen next, the thing to do is look to see what's, look, look at what's just happened. And uh, um, my intention this afternoon is simply to provide a short resume of the history of ME and uh, related illnesses uh, with a view to trying to give you some insights into why it is that uh, there is such controversy over its causation uh, and consequently such controversy over how we go about investigating and treating it. Now, um, it's fair to say that the first really good description of the illness that we now understand to be ME probably appeared in the medical literature in the 1880s uh, when a man called Beard, an American neurologist, described what he called uh, neurasthenia. And uh, the original paper uh, does appear to describe exactly uh, what uh, we now know to be ME. So here we have a first description of uh, disease on paper in the academic medical literature of an illness which uh, is still with us. Um, two well-known historical figures uh, at that time uh, also probably suffered from ME, one, one being Charles Darwin and the other Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale apparently, after returning from the Crimea, took to her bed um, but um, she clearly had um, some episodes of remission because she managed to do uh, a lot of good work from her bed but nonetheless complaining at the time also of, of being unwell and uh, it's likely that um, she contracted uh, the illness which uh, we now know to be ME um, at around about the time she left the, Crim the Crimea. And then since then we have had um, outbreaks of um, illnesses with the symptoms that we recognize in Los Angeles in 1939, Iceland in 1946, and then there's the famous royal free outbreak in 1955 um, when the term ME was first coined. However, Melvin Ramsey um, actually coined the term benign myalgic encephalomyelitis because he uh, was being rather sort of pedantic and strict about the terminology he was using. Uh, the term benign was only used because uh, it wasn't malignant, in other words, wasn't a cancer. But uh, we now have since dropped the term benign because this is by no means a benign illness in terms of its uh, 
effect on, uh, on the lifestyles of the people who are afflicted by it. Um, other countries have been, have been affected. In Durban, there was an outbreak in 1955. And then there was a the famous Lake Tahoe uh, outbreak in 1984, where the uh, CDC, the Communicable Diseases Surveillance Center from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, went to investigate an outbreak of this illness. Um, and it was they who, turned the, who, who provided the term chronic fatigue syndrome, which I know many of you are a little bit against because it doesn't really encompass and, and, and um, uh, really give the full flavor of the effect of the illness. However, um, I will from now on use the term uh, ME stroke chronic fatigue syndrome. We've had all these descriptive terms, neurasthenia, there are pe people who've described this illness who've called it abortive polymyelitis, uh, atypical poliomyelitis, benign myalgic encephalomyelitis that was Melvin Ramsey, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic fatigue and immune dysfunction syndrome, and also fibromyalgia. In my view, fibromyalgia is probably um, one end of a spectrum of the same illness where the predominant feature is musculoskeletal pain. Um, because certainly there are people at the other end of the spectrum who have, who have all the, the standard features of um, uh, fatigue, unrelieved by sleep, cognitive disturbance, uh, recurrent episodes of malaise who don't get musculoskeletal pain. Um, and I'm certain that uh, fibromyalgia should actually be included under the same heading overall uh, uh, as well. In the next slide, Horace. So that's given you a sort of uh, an overall view of, of uh, the history of, of the disease and the terminology attaching to it. My own first experiences uh, of this illness uh, was when I was working at the Hospital for Drug Diseases. Um, I'd been introduced as a, an ME specialist, although my uh, original interest uh, along more conventional lines was in tropical medicine. Uh, and infectious diseases, and indeed I'd spent two years um, uh, in the tropics in Nigeria as a medical research council unit there, um, learning about tropical diseases. And when I returned to the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, um, we began to see a lot of VSOs, VSO standing for Voluntary Service Overseas. These were youngsters who had either just uh, graduated from university and wanting to um, contribute their bit to the uh, developing world had gone off to uh, usually a tropical part of the world to attempt to um, improve the lot of the um, poorer people living there. And uh, many of them would come back with infections they'd picked up uh, in these environments. Um, and of particular note was malaria, which is one of the major ones. Typhoid, bilharzia, you name it, they would, they would get it. Um, and in the majority of cases, the appropriate treatment would cure the disease and you'd see the person walk out of hospital. Now, in a very small minority of patients, some uh, could walk out of hospital but never quite really recovered. And then when you follow them up in outpatients to see how they're getting on, they were knackered. They were completely and utterly uh, unable to return to work some of them had actually hauled themselves out of bed that day to come to see me and our patients. And here was a clinical syndrome which followed in the aftermath of an acute infectious disease which I had never seen before and which um, I was only relatively dimly aware of through Melvin Ramsey's work. And uh, so I began to think, well, there's something to this. Um, and. Uh, many of my colleagues sort of said, well, what are you bothered about? They're all just depressed and you just, what you need to do is give them antidepressants and tell them to go away because the antidepressants will make them better. Um, well, that didn't work. And um, in many instances, these people were not getting better on anti antidepressants and sometimes were getting worse. So the other enigma here as well was that with using the routine laboratory uh, investigations we had at the time, um, there was no apparent cause for their illness. There was no apparent 
uh, aberration in their routine biochemistry or hematology or whatever. So here was an illness which ostensibly uh, was causing nasty symptoms, but in which no uh, conventional laboratory test could actually uh, provide a label for. So the question was why? The next slide. We go back to um, the, the days, the pre-scientific days, when um, human society was subject to all sorts of illnesses. And um, it's probably fair to say that the human psyche isn't happy unless it can actually attribute a cause to a phenomenon, actually decide, well, this is due to that. This makes you feel more, more uh, um, secure in your place in the universe if you, begin, if you understand how things happen. If you don't understand how things happen, well, then that gives rise to insecurity. So there's this drive to understand why something happens, even if it's to the point of making false attributions as to the causation of something. And the earliest attribu attributions are, were um, usually involved malign influences of various kinds, evil spirits, the wrath of God, uh, ill-disposed deceased ancestors. Um, and I'm afraid to say that um, in the light of, of modern times, you can add to that list abnormal illness belief. Some of you will know that particular phrase, and I'll come on to it a bit later. Then really in the late 19th century, uh, the, a rational approach towards the understanding of illness began to be uh, employed. Um, although there was it's, uh, it's fair to say that um, a rational approach of this nature had been employed many centuries before, particularly when the Romans realized that it was uh, a good idea to drain stagnant, stagnant water away from marshes and away from encampments of soldiers, because the presence of stagnant water uh, nearby uh, dwellings and encampments seemed to be associated with the occurrence of malaria. And um, malaria... Uh, seemed also to be uh, uh, banished from the communities where they could get rid of this stagnant water. And some imaginative, imaginative soul said, well, it's the foul-smelling air that arises from these marshes and stagnant water um, which uh, give you, gives rise to uh, malaria. Um, and uh, hence the term malaria. Malaria is simply bad air in Italian. And um, um, so here was an example of, uh, of a rational approach based on a false assumption which actually worked. Um, and um, it's probably fair to say that uh, that's how science works even now. You create a hypothesis which you try to prove, and if you can't prove it, uh, well then you move on to the next hypothesis. Uh, sometimes the wrong hypothesis is falsely proved to be correct, in a, as was the case with the Romans. Um, and uh, thereby you get a sort of stalling process in understanding. When the germ theory of disease was first validated in the 1880s, there was huge opposition to Robert Koch, who was really the sort of the forerunner uh, of uh, um, people who uh, discovered microorganisms, in other words, bacteria in the first instance, malaria parasites uh, also, around about the 1880s. These are the people who began to lay the foundations of proper understanding uh, of disease processes, particularly the diseases due to infection. However, um, alongside these rational scientists, there were people who also thought themselves to be equally rational, who were always invoked uh, the human mind, the psyche, the subconscious, as a cause of symptoms, as a cause of disease. Next, next slide. <coughs> And so we end up with this current Western tradition of uh, body doctors, in other words, the equivalent of car mechanics, physicians and surgeons who fix your body, um, fix the bits that go wrong, give you drugs to put some bit of the metabolism right. Uh, and also then there are mind doctors, the psychiatrists and psychologists. There's a, now, inevitably, there's a dichotomy of understanding, dichotomy of, of uh, of philosophy between these two groups of people, which gives rise to conflict. Next slide. The body doctors have 
what's called a biomedical model of disease, whereas the mind doctors have a biopsychosocial model. Next slide. And in my view, a bio, bio, the biomedical model of disease uh, comprises a scientifically definable abnormality of organic function giving rise to disease. And this is possible, the identification of such diseases is possible only with the development of current scientific methods. Early examples of this scientific method involved anthrax, tuberculosis, cholera, malaria. All of the, the infectious bugs which cause these diseases were discovered in the 1880s and 1890s. Now, and later examples uh, of this discovery process came with the discovery of HIV uh, as the cause of AIDS, and that took until about 1984 um, before HIV was discovered, although, as a footnote, I'd say that HIV didn't arrive in the human community probably until the late 1950s. And then Lyme disease uh, also, um, the causative organism was really only, was only discovered in the, in the 1980s, despite being around in the human population for quite some period of time before then. So, really, we have this dichotomy of understanding between one group of doctors and another. Can we go on to the next slide? The biopsychosocial model espoused by the the mind doctors. Pr pr is, comprises a tendency to attribute psychosocial influences as the cause of disease. Um, and it's fair to say that depressive illness in many instances can be due to psychological influences. Probably less, less uh, the, the, in the case of schizophrenia, that's rather uh, less the case. However, it's also fair to say that in genuine depressive illness, there is actually disturbance of brain chemistry, which is definable as an organic disturbance. Likewise, with schizophrenia, it's not um, a functional disorder of an otherwise orderly mind. Uh, many schizophrenics, uh, after they die at post-mortem, have been found to have architectural uh, um, disorders within their brain, which would suggest, again, that here is an organic uh, cause for um, a disorder which manifests with mental symptoms rather than physical symptoms. Next slide. So we have these two separate theories of disease which are espoused by two separate bodies of doctors with the mind and the body being regarded as separate entities and apparently subject to different influences. And um, 